Good afternoon and welcome. Um, my name is Rick Putnam. I'm chair of the executive board of the World Affairs Council of Orange County and have the pleasure of opening our program today focused on the imminent national elections in Mexico and their implications. Our program is titled History in the Making, Mexico's Potential First Female President and the Interplay of Elections, Immigration and the Fentanyl Crisis with Ambassador Jeffrey Davidow. I wanna thank our sister uh, World Affairs Councils across the country first who have promoted this program to their membership and those include um, the World Affairs Council or WAC San Antonio, World Denver, Global Ties Arizona, WAC Las Vegas, and WAC Greater Hampton Roads in Virginia. Also, before we begin, just a brief moment on our council's upcoming events, which include on June 13th, we have a Zoom webinar program titled Juneteenth and Global Emancipation with a Reverend Ray Jordan, a renowned human rights professor. Again, that's a, that's a webinar program on June 13th. And then on June 26th, we'll welcome former LA mayoral candidate, prolific urban builder and Orange County resident Rick Caruso uh, here to, uh, for a talk on what can SoCal learn from cities around the world. This will be a dinner event at the Pacific Club in Newport Beach and should be a really uh, very informative discussion on his experiences um, building places here in Southern California based on his inspiration around the world. On July 24th, um, we'll also have an in-person event on Africa and its political economy titled Africa Rising. And this is with Dr. Kalechi Kalu from UC Riverside and Peter Bryant, an expert on the mining and minerals industries. That also promises, I think, to be a fascinating discussion on on the uh, fast growing African continent. Please sign up for these programs. It's very easy to do and they do sell out. So um, please access our website to, to, uh, to check those out. It's also the last day of our spring fundraising campaign, which is critically instrumental in producing these programs. We welcome and appreciate any level at which you might contribute. So now I'd like to introduce our moderator today, my friend, and colleague, uh, Chris Lynch, who is also on our executive board and co-chairs our programs committee. Chris is a global business thought leader and founder of the International Business Accelerator, or IBA. The IBA works with US companies to expand cross-border business and, foreign, and with foreign investors wishing to establish operations in the US market. An economist by training, over 30 years, he served at US embassies in Madrid, Spain, Santiago, Chile, Bonn, Germany, and Bogota, Colombia, and was the Counselor for Economic and Commercial Affairs at the U.S. Embassy in El Salvador. In these roles, he served as a daily liaison to host governments on economic issues and their analysis for policy action. Chris also served in Washington, D.C. in the Office of Energy Policy, and while at the State Department, was loaned out to Caterpillar to set, set up their finance company in Mexico as an example of his work. His last post before retiring was as U.S. Consul General in Hamburg, Germany. He's a senior adjunct professor of international business at Golden Gate University and speaks fluent German and Spanish. Uh, please welcome Chris. And Chris, I'll hand it over to you. Thank you. Okay. Um, thanks, Rick. Um, I'm really pleased to have today uh, Ambassador Davidow. You know, he's he's one of the few out there who hold the rank of career ambassador, which is the top uh, rank in, in the U.S. Foreign Service. Uh, the Foreign Service, by the way, just this past week celebrated its 100th anniversary. Um, and so we're we're both very proud of that of that organization and having been there. He's for me a, a diplomat's diplomat. And it really is. It's a great pleasure to do that. Um, run across him in, uh, you know, in his, my career. Uh, for example, he was my assistant secretary when I was in uh, El Salvador and uh, appreciate that kind of steady hand, that uh, just fine touch in, in terms of, of understanding uh, diplomacy and how to implement it. Um, he started off, um, was born in, in Boston, went to UMass, 
uh, got an MA from University of Minnesota, did some postgraduate work uh, in 68 on a Fulbright travel grant. Uh, there's been so many great people who have done Fulbright work over the years, and it's just an example of how that continues to produce leaders. Uh, he joined the Foreign Service in 69, uh, was uh, at the uh, embassy in Guatemala. Then in uh, 672 to 74, he was uh, in the political section in Santiago. Um, that was during the coup. Um, I kind of bookended things because I was my time in Chile was when Pinochet left power. So um, it's been a uh, it, it's a lot of uh, things we can learn from there, too. Uh, he then um, switched over a lot of his emphasis in his career into Africa um, and uh, in Cape Town, uh, the Office of Southern Africa Affairs in D.C., uh, Embassy in Harare. And then in um, 88, he was nominated by President Reagan to be ambassador to Zambia, which he held till 1990. Um, and then after that, he um, served as a, a, a DAS uh, in the Africa Bureau. Um, and then he was nominated uh, to be ambassador to Venezuela in 96. And certainly Venezuela having that expertise of we'll get into that a little bit later is, is sort of a key element in understanding at least a lot in terms of having the, the migration crisis. Um, and uh, as I mentioned, um, he was uh, Assistant Secretary of State for uh, Western Hemisphere in 96 to 98. Um, and then he was appointed to Mexico, 98 to 2002. Um, he retired in 2003 and um, his books, he wrote a really interesting book when he was um, um, uh, at the Rockefeller Center for uh, and the John F. Kennedy School of Government, um, was the U.S. and Mexico, the bear and the porcupine. I think that's a fascinating title. And I really, in some ways, sort of um, uh, gives sort of a, a framework for sort of how the relations are be between the two countries. Uh, since uh, 2003, he's been uh, president of the Institute of the Americas there in La Jolla, uh, associated with UCSD, and we are really fortunate to have him today. Um, just in terms of how things will be running, um, he, Ambassador Davidow will be starting off, uh, give us some uh, uh, his own perspectives on the election. And then um, uh, after that, uh, about 12.30, 12.35, we'll start opening up to questions. If you want to ask questions, please put them in the Q&A box. You see that at the bottom of your screen. Uh, the chat sort of just goes back and forth among the audience, but the Q&A will get those uh, questions to me and I'll be uh, uh, making a list of questions and see where we can sort of fit things in um, for the areas that he hasn't uh, covered. So um, at this point, I'd uh, very much like to turn over to Ambassador Davido, and uh, the floor is yours, Ambassador. Well, thank you very much, Chris, and thank you, Rick. Uh, as some of you know, uh, uh, Abe Lowenthal of Los Angeles was scheduled to be with us today and share the talking with me. Abe is having some health issues, and I know all of us send him our best wishes. He's an expert on Mexico, uh, yeah. and uh, uh, unfortunately, we'll all miss hearing him today, but we can look forward to the future. I guess the first question we have to ask is just how important are these elections in Mexico for us in the United States? Is what happens in Mexico a vital concern to the U.S.? And my answer is an emphatic yes. And I think for those of us in Southern California, uh, like my friends in Orange County, uh, myself in San Diego, there's, there's no doubt about this. What happens in Mexico is of extreme importance because it affects the daily life 
of the United States in so many ways. And we'll get into that. Now, there are a lot of elections going on this year in the world. Uh, uh, India is going through a multi-week process. South Africa just had very interesting elections yesterday. Uh, Britain's going to have elections this summer. But I would argue that what happens in Mexico as it impacts us on a daily basis, the jobs we have, uh, the people we live with in our, our society, uh, in many cases, the air we breathe, uh, all of this uh, really comes down to an immense impact of Mexico on us. And so I think it's worth talking about. It's uh, dangerous for a speaker to talk about election. In 2016, I was thinking today, I was invited uh, to give a speech to a group of businessmen on November 7th. That is the day after the American elections. And this was an important group, and I had really done a lot of research. I had gone through the policy statements of the uh, of Hillary Clinton. Uh, I knew what her politics were. I knew how she viewed Mexico. And my, my job was going to be on the morning after the election to tell these businessmen how to prepare for Hillary Clinton. Uh, well, that didn't work out as I expected. So I sort of blubbered through a speech that morning, which wasn't made any more easy because I had been up all night watching the results. So I, I tend to be kind of reticent and cautious when talking about elections. Uh, it's also one of the things I try to avoid is that it's certainly a mistake to view other countries' elections through our narrow political lens from the United States. Let's be honest, uh, every country is different and uh, we, we shouldn't impose mm -hmm. our, our way of thinking on other people's uh, experiences. But there are parallels between What's going to happen on June 2nd in Mexico and what's going to happen in November in our country? And I think we should be aware of those similarities, uh, which are, I think, considerable. We cannot ignore them. But before we look at these similarities, let's look at what's unique in terms of the Mexican election. And the most obvious uh, point is that Mexico is about to elect a female president. Now, when one thinks of Mexico and in the, the great home of machismo, uh, it's uh, really quite incredible. It's something that uh, certainly we in the United States haven't been able to carry off. In a, we have not elected female president, obviously. And the two candidates are certainly people of uh, great interest uh, and accomplishment. So let's talk about them first. The first candidate to mention is a woman named Claudia Scheinbaum. Uh, Ms. Scheinbaum most recently was uh, governor of the province of Mexico City, the federal district. Uh, she's an interesting person. Uh, she has been involved in politics since her student days. Interestingly, her background is that she comes from a Jewish family in uh, Mexico. Uh, there's a small Jewish community there. Her parents uh, were Eastern European emigres. They were 
uh, very much to the left, both in Europe and in Mexico. And uh, Ms. Scheinbaum began her student years as an avowed radical and played parts, an important part in demonstrations, student strikes, and what have you. And she has maintained that leftist orientation throughout her career. She is an uh, acolyte, an associate of the current president, Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador, known colloquially as AMLO, and has been one of his principal assistants for over 20 years. She is, at the same time, an accomplished academic. She studied at Berkeley. She's a, a, a world-renowned expert on environmental issues. And uh, she is someone who I think uh, is, in her own way, uh, more cosmopolitan than her boss, AMLO. Big question for her would be, will AMLO's popularity, and uh, after six years in office, Lopez Obrador still has a very significant popularity in Mexico. Some polls indicate maybe as high as 60% of the population. Uh, I personally think it's less, but it's still a majority of Mexicans uh, support him and his policies. The big question for Claudia Scheinbaum is, in terms of this election, whether that support will carry over, whether his coattails will be large enough for her. The other candidate is equally interesting. Her name is Societil Galvez. For those of you who are furiously taking notes, I'm joking here. Societil is spelled X-O-C-H-I-T-I-L. It's an indigenous Indian name. And indeed, Societil comes from an indig indigenous background. Uh, and she also is a, a very well-trained uh, personality. She's been active in, in politics uh, and uh, she's well-respected. Now, she is representing uh, the opposition to AMLO. And this opposition is made up principally of three political parties. The PRI, which actually ran Mexico for about 70 years, when it was essentially a one-party state. The PAN, which is the conservative opposition, and the PRD, which is uh, a leftist uh, uh, party. The only thing these three groups have in common is their opposition to AMLO. And uh, maintaining unity among the three parties is difficult. Uh, the alliance it reminds me of the old story of a, of a camel. What's a camel? A camel is a horse put together by a committee. That's what you get. So the big question for uh, Societil uh, is whether she will be able to build upon these uh, the support of these three parties, maintain unity, and come out as the winter as the winner. Right now, and consistently, all of the polls uh, have indicated that Claudia Scheinbaum is likely is the likely winner. Now, polls is polls. We have our own experience, so I don't think we can put too much faith in them. But uh, it, it would seem right now that, that 
uh, Claudia is in the lead. Societal, by the way, I should say, her views are considerably more conservative than Claudia's in terms of how she views the role of the state, uh, her concerns about the too much power uh, given to state enterprises, including Pemex, the famous Mexican oil company. Uh, she is, uh, I would say, instinctively more inclined towards positions of the United States in international affairs than Claudia is. I'm not saying Claudia is necessarily an enemy of the U.S., uh, in, uh, but I, I think we would see uh, in Societal somebody who was more conducive for, to a, uh, a good relationship with us. Let's talk about some of the similarities uh, between our electoral cycle and Mexico's. Of course, this is something that's interesting. Mexico has presidential elections every six years. We have them, of course, every four years. We all know that. So it means every 12 years, the two countries have elections in the same year. And that just makes for very interesting interactions. Um, let me just say a few words, and I'll try to do this without uh, uh, indicating any biases that I might have about U.S. politics. But I think it's fair to say that in both countries, we have a very polarizing candidate. Uh, or let me say this, a polarizing figure in the United States. I think that's Donald Trump. And I don't think anybody can deny whether you support Trump or against Trump, that he is a polarizing figure. In Mexico, the polarizing figure is not one of the two candidates I just talked about, but AMLO himself. And in, in fact, this election is about whether Mexico wants to continue the policies and programs and attitudes of AMLO whether it wants to go in a different direction. So the, le the election is less about Societal and Claudia. It's about Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador. So let me say a few words about him. Lopez Obrador has been a fixture of America, of Mexican politics for 40 years, or close to 40 years. He ran for president in uh, 2006 and in 2012, and he lost. I'm sorry, was it 2006, 2012? Yeah. And uh, he did not accept the results. After each of those elections, he said the election had been rigged, and he brought people into the streets for demonstrations that lasted Weak. Uh, he uh, his attitude towards uh, what he promised the Mexican people, he calls it the fourth transformation, which really is another way of saying the fourth revolution in Mexico. The first was against the Spanish at the beginning of the nineteenth century. Uh, the second revolution was in the middle of the 19th century that was basically liberal versus conservative, which resulted in uh, Benito Juarez winning. Uh, the third uh, transformation revolution was in the early 20th century, what we know as the Mexican Revolution. So he calls this the tra fourth transition, but he's really talking about a fourth revolution, which is a bloodless resolution, but he wants to change and has wanted to change how Mexico governs itself. Uh, and he's very aggressive. Lopez Obrador does not have adversaries. He has enemies. 
And he makes this clear every morning. He's a master of public affairs. Every morning, early in the morning, he gives a press conference that goes on for two or three hours. And in doing so, he controls the news cycle every day. And when he talks about uh, members of the press, members of the opposition, members of the business community, as I say, these are not political opponents. These are the enemies of the fourth transition. So we're dealing with uh, a highly polarized society in Mexico with a central figure, ironically not one of the candidates, who is of extreme important importance. Uh, the, uh, there is in Mexico, there's another similarity, uh, but I don't want to stretch it too much, um, a level of violence and threat in the election. Now, we had our own experience with uh, violence after the last election, but it's quite different in Mexico. What you have in Mexico is the involvement of organized crime in the electoral process, largely at the local level, where it is important for crime groups, narco traffickers, others, to have control of the local police, the local government, so they can go about their nefarious business. And so what we have seen in Mexico in this election and in recent elections is that many people don't want to be candidates. Keep in mind in Mexico, not only is there a presidential election on June 2nd, uh, the entire both houses of Congress are, will be elected in about 20,000 local positions. And what we have seen in just in recent days is violence directed at many of the candidates. Uh, uh, two or three dozen have been killed. Many have just given up. They don't want to deal with with the threat of violence to themselves or to their family. And, and, and so I'm not making a direct parallel between the violence we saw in the United States after our last election and what is existing in Mexico. It's very different. But there is a threat of force that's in the air. Another similarity is that the congressional vote, the election of the full lower and upper chamber in Mexico, it will be critical. And I would say that I think it's going to be critical in the United States. We're on the razor's edge, divided Senate, divided House. How that turns out will have a great impact in the United States on what the next president will be able to accomplish. In Mexico, the important issue is this. As much as AMLO has tried to change the nature of the Mexican government, and he's done this largely in one way by going after the independent checks and balances of the government, notably the Supreme Court, notably the highly thought of independent electoral commission. As much as he's been able to accomplish in that regard, he has been blocked because he did not have a supermajority, that is two thirds of Congress with him. He had an ample majority, but not the supermajority. Now, if either of these presidential candidates gets a supermajority for their party in Congress, things will change dramatically. In some ways, the congressional election in Mexico uh, is as important as the presidential election. 
Let me just uh, mention some of the challenges that the next president of Mexico is going to have to deal with. And the question is, which of the two principal candidates is likely to be the most adept in dealing with these issues, all of which have a direct impact uh, on the United States. First, I think we have to talk about violence. Uh, AMLO came into office promising that he would reduce the crime in Mexico, the homicides in Mexico, uh, uh, the uh, threat that many people feel on a daily basis, not necessarily from narco traffickers, but from local criminals who extort businesses, extort people, because the police are unwilling or incapable to stop that. So the next president, and it's fair to say that AMLO has not been a success in this regard. It's one of his failures. He does not admit it, but Mexico, uh, the violence crime situation in Mexico has not improved. And indeed probably has gotten worse in the last six years. So the new president's going to have to try to figure out how to deal with that. And it's intractable in so many ways. Uh, the next president's going to have a lot of uh, economic issues to confront. AMLO has been relatively conservative in terms of Mexico's budget. Uh, he has not thrown away uh, uh, very much money as populist governments are prone to do. But the country is in serious debt. And to add to this, uh, the government uh, takes on the debts of Pemex, the, this oil company, which is the most indebted petroleum company in the world. So the next president is going to have very significant budgetary issues to deal with. Also, there's a great challenge. Let's, let's uh, uh, put this under the category of near shoring. As we see companies taking a more skeptical look of investment in China, there's a great opportunity for those companies to move operations to Mexico, and some have. But in point of fact, Mexico, although it has a tremendous amount of uh, um, American investment, has not taken significant uh, advantage of nearshoring. Companies that are already there are expanding, but new companies are very skeptical. They worry about the rule of law in Mexico. They worry about the possibilities of attracting sufficient enough educated employees. They worry about electricity. They worry about water resources. So Mexico, over the past few years, has had a tremendous opportunity under AMLO to attract foreign investment, more foreign investment, uh, but has really not done as good a job as would have been hoped. And, of course, big issue with the United States that Mexico has to deal with, will have to deal with, is migration. AMLO has helped somewhat by trying to stem some of the flow, but we know that migration is the biggest issue in our election, and the numbers are absolutely staggering. The other big issue, which is tied to the question of violence, is narcotics, particularly fentanyl. How will the new president of Mexico deal with this? And let me just, uh, the answer, of course, in terms of uh, narcotics is greater levels of uh, cooperation with the United States government, 
in the same uh, with some of these other issues. A big, let me just finish by saying that uh, starting next year, uh, the three governments of North America, Canada, U.S., Mexico, are going to be reviewing uh, the trade treaty, let's call it NAFTA II, which came into force a few years ago. And there's a tremendous amount of trade friction. There's a tre tremendous amount of trade. Mexico, as I might have stated, is now our largest trading partner. It has surpassed China. But yet within that, there are real issues relating to automobiles, steel, uh, agricultural issues. Uh, all three countries are intent on pursuing their own national interests, as makes sense. Uh, and so we are up for a revision of NAFTA too. And it's really uh, going to be a tough time, no matter who is elected in Mexico, no matter who is elected in the United States. So next year, year after, uh, all I can say, suggest is buckle your seatbelts. It's going to be a time of considerable friction. Uh, I think we'll get through it. I've been personally involved following this uh, for, well, Jesus, I can't even remember, maybe close to 40 years. And there's always a crisis. There's always something going on. Uh, and yet somehow we stumble ahead. So I, I don't think that's a ringing call of optimism, but uh, uh, let me stop there and I'd be delighted to uh, have a conversation. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Ambassador. Um, by the way, um, it's, uh, you know, I encourage you to put questions into the Q&A box. So we've had a couple so far, uh, looking forward to more of them. But the um, first question comes out from who was your um, uh, U.S. Army uh, military attache, Richard Downey, when you were in Mexico. And, and Richard, who was with us and actually helped initiate this uh, I think is now with uh, running the uh, World Trade Affairs uh, World Affairs Council in LA, um, but he sent along a, a really interesting question. It leads on your your discussion about AMLO, and he says, "How likely is it uh, if Claudia Scheinbaum wins, as expected, that AMLO will try to continue to influence politics from behind the scene?" Well, hello, Richard. Richard always, uh, we worked closely together. He was always asking uh, asking me questions that I could not answer. Uh, let me just give an, uh, an example. When I, when I went to Mexico as ambassador, which was in 1998, the former president, the immediate past president, was Carlos Salinas, very, very effective president with something of a bad reputation. And people kept telling me that Salinas, although he was no longer president, really must be behind the scenes running everything uh, for the president of the day, who was a very competent man, Ernesto Zedillo. In the four years I served in Mexico, I didn't see any, any uh, evidence of that. Uh, it, just was part of the Mexican conspiratorial view of politics. My thinking is, if Claudia becomes president, she's going to be president. AMLO has said he's going to go back to his ranch and not be involved. Whether you believe him or not, a president once out of power loses power. And I know there are many Mexicans who think that AMLO uh, is really going to try to retain his influence. He will have influence, but I don't think he would be running the government and controlling Claudia Scheinbaum 
should she be the next president? Okay. Thank you. Uh, following up on that, um, uh, another question come in. Would you consider uh, Claude Sharma to be a pure copy ideologically of AMLO, or will her previous uh, political activism leader become more of a, quote, radical president? Is there a specific issue where she diverges greatly from uh, AMLO? Yeah, I, I think that's a good question, because I think, although they're both on the left, I think they're different. AMLO, uh, for people who have watched him over the years, has a lot of the instinctual gut feelings of a mid-20th century pre-politician, uh, much like President Echeverria. Uh, uh, if people are familiar with that, a certain uh, natural uh, anti-institutional, anti-American, or highly suspicious of America, uh, highly nationalistic. And of course, we all know Mexico, uh, uh, so much of its politics is uh, highly nationalistic. And the great insult of, of Mexican history is that it lost so much of its territory to the United States in the 19th century. So there was a time in Mexico where any politician could really get votes by criticizing the Yankees. That's gone down in recent years. But that, I think, formed AMLO's orientation. I think Claudia is a much more thoughtful person her radicalism of her youth has not disappeared, but I don't think that uh, she's likely to be an extraordinarily radical president because she realizes that this would be dangerous internally in Mexico. Uh, it would uh, such policies could disrupt disrupt the relationship with the United States. But yeah, she comes at her leftist orientation from a, a more theoretical, uh, um, ideological uh, uh, view than, than AMLO. I don't know if I've made myself clear, but it, it may not make a real difference in, in actual practice, but they do come from different, different backgrounds in that regard. Okay. Um, going over to this, one of the issues that you raised there, the U.S. Um, relations that they're going to have to deal with, obviously the top is, is migration, as you pointed out. Um, there was a, an article in the Washington Post this last week about uh, how even the tortilla ma makers were being, you know, threatened or, or by the cartels having to pay off for even running their tortilla shops. And but buried in that article was that they referred to an unpublished State Department poll that something like 39 percent of the population was uh, thinking or entertaining the idea of, you know, uh, trying to uh, immigrate to the United States. Um, you know, not illegally or just cross over the board, and that's up from 10%. Now, obviously, that's sort of a wish and so forth. I mean, it's 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 a thought at this point. But um, how is it, do you think, that she can make a, a, an impact on migration? And do you think she'll, she will be doing it? Well, it, it, that figure of 39%, I... Uh, I'm not sure about, and yeah, I uh, I would probably be one of the 39 percent that uh, thinks uh, it would be great to go live on the French Riviera, but I'm I haven't worked it out as yet. Okay, I don't think I'm going to get there. <laughs> uh, actually, in terms of immigration numbers, and we we're all aware of just how these numbers have gone up so much. Uh, for the first time last year, less than 50% of the people crossing the Mexican border into the United States 
uh, without documentation, less than 50% were Mexicans. We have seen a tremendous flow of people from other countries, both in the hemisphere, particularly Venezuela, Cuba, Nicaragua, the three, the three truly communist countries, as well as from Africa, Middle East, what have you. And we have received some support from the Mexican government in terms of stopping migration at their southern border, uh, uh, using the Mexican military to do so. But it is a, a, a major problem. But let's be realistic about this. And I think most of us, certainly those of us in South, Southern uh, uh, California understand our system is a disgrace. Our migratory system doesn't work. Our migratory system is not defending uh, uh, our goals as a country. And I think this is a tremendous embarrassment. And it's not something new. The last major change to the American immigration system was in 1986. And we've known for decades that there are things that we have to do to make migration safe and legal and in meeting our interests, both cultural and economic in the United States. And until we do that, we're going to see the mess that we see in migration. Uh, I, I, I think we've had some cooperation from AMLO's government. I would hope that whoever is the next president would increase that. Of course, in Mexico, the big answer is, or the, the answer is, how to make life better for Mexican citizens. So they're not interested in migration, that 39% that you talked about. And that has to do with the economic development of Mexico. And I think particularly in the last six years under AMLO, there has been a disappointing progress. People who have good jobs, uh, who are in this expanding middle class in Mexico, uh, who are not living in poverty, those people don't want to emigrate. I and mean, if anybody has gone to Mexico, I mean, I'm sure you, people who have gone to Mexico in this audience in recent years, and you go to a city like Monterrey or Guadalajara, I mean, these are uh, giant cities with large populations and very well-functioning economies. They're not the people who are Mexicans who are trying to emigrate. It's the poor, particularly from the south of Mexico, which is underdeveloped. So I, what can a new Mexican president do to help on immigration? The best thing would be to develop the Mexican economy through policies that are designed to promote investment designed to promote the private sector, designed to educate people to work in new industries. Uh, the Mexican system in its own way is broken, and so is ours. And we have to live with that and try to improve it, both countries. Um, Aram Sassoonian is asking that, Considering Mexico is now the U.S. largest trading partner, what are the fastest growing industries between the United States and Mexico? And what are the potential enterprise and opportunities for Americans looking to work in Mexico? Well, looking to work in Mexico, let me just say that there has been a tremendous influx of Americans into Mexico since COVID. And this is, in some way, it's part of the new work generation. It doesn't matter where you live uh, if you've got your computer yeah. and to do your work. And indeed, uh, large numbers of particularly young Americans have found that living in Mexico City or Monterey or Tijuana is cheaper, uh, in some ways more pleasant, 
uh, and uh, they are going to Mexico to work. Uh, uh, the possibility of Americans going to work for Mexican companies is less significant. What we have in Mexico in terms of industry, uh, the two points I would make. We discovered when we closed our border at the beginning of COVID, just how thoroughly we were dependent upon Mexican and U.S. companies operating in Mexico for their involvement in the supply chain in the United States. And sometimes it's very significant elements of the supply chain. Sometimes it's just very, you know, widgets that we can't produce our products without those. And there was a tremendous amount of effort, successful, to uh, clear up the supply chain issues. Uh, the biggest exports from Mexico to the United States are essentially in the automotive industry. And this is very complex. Uh, both President Biden and uh, uh, Mr. Trump have indicated that they are very concerned about one thing, Chinese companies coming in, manufacturing in Mexico and exporting automobiles to the United States. Uh, there's also a concern in the American labor movement about more of the jobs that have moved to Mexico in, in terms of industrial pro, uh, production, particularly uh, uh, automotive. And this plays a role as well. So um, I think there's tremendous room for investment in Mexico. I think that there's opportunities for American companies to expand their operations there and indeed begin new operations, even in some of the cutting edge uh, industries that we're looking at today, such as chips and uh, artificial intelligence. So we are basically uh, in North America, uh, the largest integrated economy in the world. And I think we should build on that. Um, and last, it's, it's some, some interesting questions from uh, Holly Baragan. Um, she asked, first of all, what do you estimate the voting percentage that um, either of the two would need in order to get a supermajority? Would they need to get 50%? No, they, uh, AMLO came close. Uh, with the votes of his own political party and the votes of some uh, congressional votes of some smaller political parties uh, that I haven't even mentioned today. But a 50% or a narrow victory would be very unlikely to give either party a supermajority. Um, and and I, I think it's probably unlikely that either party would get a supermajority. Keep in mind that although AMLO uh, 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 you know, has 60% popularity and won a majority in, when he ran for president in 2016, three years later when there was a significant number of congressional elections in Mexico, uh, he his party did not even get a majority. They got a very strong plurality. plurality. And so uh, I think it's going to be highly difficult to get a supermajority. And I think it would require a probably something like over a 60 percent uh, vote for the one candidate or the other. Uh, that could happen. Yeah. Because one thing to keep in mind, in Mexico, as in the United States increasingly, there's very little vote splitting. If you vote for the congressional candidate 
of the party of the presidential candidate you're voting for. So it could happen. It certainly could happen. But I, I don't think it will. And then, then Holly has sort of two follow-up questions, which are more on the social implications of this, um, the, the, the race between the these two women. But you, you touched on it earlier about, you know, this is happening in the Mexico, the you know, machismo society. Um, but what about also the, the implications for, um, you know, race, la, la raza, it's, you know, they're always fine to do it, but, you know, clearly that, um, that uh, society is, um, is, you know, comes from an indigenous background. To, what role do you think that has in terms of the, the society and the uh, interaction with politics? I think it will have a significant impact. Uh, about 10% of the Mexican population is considered indigenous. A very high percentage, in addition to that, are come from mestizo, mestizo backgrounds, meaning a mixture of European and uh, indigenous and in some cases Afro-Mexican blood. And I think uh, if she were to win, uh, and she has ex been involved in supporting indigenous communities through her political life in Mexico, I think it would be very important and symbolic and have practical effects in terms of the integration of indigenous communities with respect of their culture into Mexico. Okay. Well, um, we're coming up to the top of the hour here. So I really want to, um, you know, thank you again for your, for your time and the insights. I think it's been uh, that the kind of discussion that you need to get down into into the details and certainly your your breadth of knowledge has been important there um it's mexico and mexican politics has always been very uh very important but very um complicated and sometimes not very transparent to, to us on the north american side um but at any rate i want to um you know thank you for that right now and what i wanted to do is turn it back to um Rick Putnam at this point, and then he has some uh, points for us uh, 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 lead going out. So um, if we can have Rick back there, Rick. Thank you, Chris. Yeah. Yeah, here's Rick. Thank, thank Rick you, Chris. Rick falling asleep. No, <laughs> not at all. Thank you. Thank you both. That was really a fascinating discussion. Um, so so thank you, Ambassador Davidow. Thank you, Chris. You, you guys have provided a great perspective for us to interpret the results of, um, of the Mex Mexican election next week. So um, really valuable uh, lens uh, for, for us all. Um, I just want to add that, um, yeah, as a, as a bonus to our traditional program, uh, today we'd like to now continue the discussion for another 10 minutes, minutes or so. Um, and that's in order to help um, have some of the student um, students in our audience uh, um, submit questions on careers in international relations, how to access that. Um, we have two uh, career, um, you know, State Department folks here, um, and uh, we'd like to offer this opportunity to the students who are, I believe, from um, uh, from UC Riverside um, on the webinar today to to have that opportunity. So um, again, thank you both. And, and now I'm going to turn it back over to you, Chris, to um, to field those questions, which I, th I think um, we're going to coordinate in the chat. Uh, but um, yeah, so so please put your, your questions there and in, into the chat chat uh, about the career things. Um, uh, it's uh, I, I don't know, it, it just sort of the it's a general thing where looking at this is that 
I think I, I read a quote from one of our colleagues once is that, you know, there are days that I woke up that I was frustrated. There are days I woke up that I was angry, days that were kind of boring and so forth. But never did I wake up and feel that what I was doing was not important uh, and having an impact. And I guess that's sort of how I've always felt this. Um, what, what's your sort of thoughts on, on um, you know, the career in international affairs at this point um well what I, you do what you rec recommend yeah i i agree with you chris i uh, i was in the foreign service for well 34 years you were in for pretty much the same 25 yeah i think it's an incredibly fruitful way to spend one's life uh and it's, uh, I, I don't want to get syrupy about it, but it's a way of serving your country. So I'm a great fan of uh, uh, young people pursuing entrance into the foreign service. Now, the entry process and the procedures have changed a lot since you and I picked up our quill pens and <laughs> to get in. But still, it is a uh, procedure that requires testing uh, and, and interviews and what have you. Uh, let me just say that there are the Foreign Service is not the only way to pursue an international career. There's obviously international business, which I think when Chris and I joined the Foreign Service many decades ago, uh, wasn't as uh, ample. Uh, the opportunities weren't as, as much there as they are today. So if you're interested in international affairs, looking at international business makes great sense, in addition to possibly the Foreign Service. Within the government, there are many opportunities for international activity. Uh, uh, certainly, uh, uh, the CIA uh, is, is something, and I, I, I don't think we should be embarrassed about talking about the CIA. We need uh, good intelligence officers around the world to help protect our country. There are also civil service positions in the State Department, in it, uh, apart from the Foreign Service positions, many of them involved in, in uh, intelligence analysis. Uh, there are international opportunities, not only in the CIA, but in other agencies of government, treasury, energy, elsewhere. So I guess what I would say is to young people who are interested in it, uh, I found being in the Foreign Service very rewarding, and I would encourage people to look at it closely. But there are many other opportunities, many more opportunities today than decades ago. Yeah. Um, also, to add to that is the uh, uh, Commerce Department, the Foreign Commercial Service. Of course, yeah. of course. Sorry. Yeah. And the and department as well yes right right so yeah that's right what so what kind of backgrounds somebody wants to do international business international relations what should they be doing in terms of their you know in their university studies well i don't think university studies matter that much i mean i think good professional grounding and whatever uh, you choose at university, whether it's business or liberal arts or history, uh, uh, get that grounding. But what I would say is anybody who's interested in international affairs as, uh, as a career ought to be reading the, the New York Times on a daily basis. And if not the New York Times, some other uh, like uh, some other paper like that, the Washington Post, Wall Street Journal, 
being internationally aware is of absolute criti uh, critical importance. And I think, sure, you could help prepare yourself in terms of history and politics and poli sci as a student, uh, but being aware uh, is a very important. Also, I think the Foreign Service, to speak of the Foreign Service, is generally looking for people not, not straight out of university. Mm -hmm. The average age, and this may have changed, Chris, uh, in, in recent years, the average age of, of um, for many years of Foreign Service entrance was mid to late 20s. Yeah. And this was important because it allowed those people to experience international activity and to demonstrate a capacity to live overseas. So I'm sure in your class, Chris, in my class, uh, there were people who had studied overseas, people who had been in the Peace Corps, some people who had been in the military. And I think that's important because it's, it's, it's essential that somebody feel comfortable living outside the United States. Mm -hmm. It's not just, you know, am I cosmopolitan or am I provincial? Uh, uh, there are personal issues. Uh, are you, uh, is, a, is someone who wants to get involved willing to live away from their parents and siblings for years at a time? Uh, uh, when you're married, you have to think about what are the opportunities for your spouse. So there are, there are personal issues and, 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 and elsewise that I think uh, it helps to spend some time after uh, getting a, a bachelor's degree uh, in terms of building your resume uh, and your own personal preferences about living uh, an international life. When you're in the Foreign Service, uh, for instance, you're going to spend uh, probably at least half of your career overseas. And that brings uh, challenges to families and to spouses. And uh, also, uh, in many cases, you're living in, can be living in inhospitable, inhospitable or dangerous environments. So all of those are things to think about. But just basically in terms of preparation, get a good college education, become internationally aware, know what's going on, uh, and have some opportunity to uh, live internationally and operate internationally before you, in this case, go into the Foreign Service. And, and, and just talking generally about those um, you know, international careers writ large, and I think all of that is that... Um, one of the things that is that we can be also involved um, citizens um, in in the whole process, um, and you know being being involved um, in organizations like the the World Affairs uh, Council. Uh, we have a young professionals network um, that uh, we're actively building up, and that's that's a great place to you know just again network with people who are. Um, you know, interested and aware and who you can talk about things at a more than a superficial level or, or you know, the top level you know, when it comes to what's going on in the world. Um, just one last quick question here. Um, would a JD in international law help with getting you into the Foreign Service? I, I, I think so. It's probably unlikely or not likely, I should say, that you would have uh, an opportunity to extensively use the JD. Uh, there are <clears throat> uh, legal attaches, which who actually come from the Department of Justice. And of course, 
knowing how the legal system in the U.S. and overseas works is an absolute positive plus. But I would say that it's not very likely that you would be doing international legal work uh, uh, in the Foreign Service. That's fairly limited. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's uh, that's. I, I I would agree with you on that one. Um, it, it's interesting with the getting to know my my German colleagues over the years, having been there twice, is that they um, they spend like their most of their first year in their training actually focusing on international law. So um, I don't think we value value that as much in the United States. I mean, we're we're more towards the the practical side, I guess. Yeah, so. they're serious people, you know. <laughs> so at any rate, um, there being no questions, I want to again thank you and thank you also from uh, the uh, the students. Kind of a couple comments in here about thanking you for your uh, insights and so forth. It's been a uh, it's been a really fun day, um, and um, yes, we'll um, leave it at that and. Um, everyone have a good day and we will be um again encourage you to join some of our other upcoming events um and with that we'll um sign off for today thank you very much ambassador thank you chris thank you goodbye goodbye thank you all